everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Francesca Righetti. She is an associate professor at the Department of Experimental and Applied Psychology at the VU Amsterdam. Dr. Righetti's research focuses on close relationships. More specifically, she studies sacrifice and ambivalence and how the whole processes shape relationship dynamics. And we're going to talk about that, about close relationships today. So, Dr. Righetti, welcome to the show. It's a huge pleasure to everyone. Thank you, Ricardo. Thank you for inviting me today to the interview. Great. So, um, so talking about close relationships, I would like to start by asking you about a sacrifice, because sometimes people in their close relationships, particularly romantic relationships, uh, sacrifice their own self-interest in the benefit of their partner. So when do people do that and what motivates them to do it? Yeah, so sacrifice basically means foregoing, as you were mentioning, your own self-interest, your own goal or preference because of your partner or the relationship. In our studies, we typically see that people report doing sacrifices almost on a daily basis or at least every other day. And uh, this uh, behavior happens when people, when partners encounter what we call a situation of divergence of interest, which basically means that partners have different preferences. For Think about, for example, uh, one partner wants to have sushi for dinner, the other wants to have a pizza, and then one of them needs to give up their own preference. This is a, an example of a small sacrifice. But of course, you all can also imagine that there can be more substantial sacrifices, such as one partner wants to have children, the other doesn't, what to do then. One partner wants to live in the countryside, the other wants to live in the center of the city, then one of them has to give up their preferences. These can be also quite big preferences. Now, what motivates people to do sacrifices? Of course, there can be all sorts of reasons, but in the literature we distinguish between uh, approach motives and avoidance motives. And the approach motives is when, uh, when you sacrifice, you have in mind something again that you want to achieve. Uh, while avoidance motives are occurs when you have a loss that you want to prevent. Mm -hmm. And then we also make a further distinction in the literature, such as when these motives are self-focus, partner focus, or relationship focus. So just to give you a little bit more of an example, people can sacrifice for an approach self motives when, for example, they want to gain a sense of self-worth from the sacrifice. They want to feel good about themselves. This can happen, of course. But other times people can also sacrifice for what we call avoidance self goals, such as not to, for example, want to feel bad or feel guilty about themselves. Other times when people are sacrificing, they are thinking about their partner instead. So it can be like an approach partner, meaning, for example, you want to make your partner feel good and you want your partner to be happy. And an avoidance partner motive will be when you don't want your partner to feel bad about giving up his own preference. Um, an example of an approach relationship motive will be when you sacrifice because you want your relationship to improve. While an example of an avoidance relationship motive would be when you don't, for example, want to avoid a conflict or want to avoid a breakup, situations like this. Now, what we see is that these motives really matter um, in terms of the outcome of the sacrifice, because uh, when people sacrifice for approach motives, they typically also feel better, they feel good about their sacrifices. While if people sacrifice for avoidance motives, what we see is that they tend to experience negative outcome after they sacrifice. And not only it's important for the person who sacrifices, but the motives are also important for the person who receives the sacrifice. Because when we receive a sacrifice, we often also infer or think about the reason why our partner has sacrificed for us. And what we see in our studies, in our data, is that we experience appreciation and gratitude for our partner only when we think that our partner has done a sacrifice to benefit us, and not when it's tainted by self-interest 
And not even when we think that the partner did it for the relationship, but not really because he cares about our own well-being. So yes, motives really do have important implication for both how the person who does the sacrifice feel, but also for the recipient of the sacrifice. But as you alluded to there, then it's not always the case that sacrifices are appreciated by the partners, right? No, unfortunately not. In fact, actually, in our data, we see that 50% of the times, partners don't even realize that the other has sacrificed. And then, even if you do realize that your partner has sacrificed, not everybody, of course, express gratitude for such a sacrifice. We don't have really the data of how often expression of gratitude occurs, uh, but we do. what do we know is that uh, if you do express gratitude, then the partner actually uh, feels better about their own sacrifices and uh, the relationship also improves. So expression of gratitude is definitely important. Mm -hmm. Are there... Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, uh, are there specific instances where sacrifices are expected, either by the partner or the person who does the sacrifice, him or herself? Yeah, for sure. Um, <clears throat> there are several variables, I would say, that will predict whether people uh, expect sacrifices to occur. It could be, for example, that some people feel very entitled to sacrifices. It could be also cultural differences. In some cultures, sacrifices are uh, more expected than in others. It could be also gender differences. Typically, women are expected to do more sacrifices in their relationship. What we see also in our data is that there is a reciprocity norm, so that if one partner sacrifices one time, uh, they expect that their partner will sacrifice next. So there are these expectations driven by many different factors. And uh, what we see in our data is that when these expectations exist, this is likely to lead to a reduction of the gratitude that you feel when you receive a sacrifice. You expect a sacrifice, so it's not a big deal. You feel less grateful. And as a result, also uh, the relationship is less benefited by the sacrifice. Mm -hmm. um, can sacrifices lead to frustration and decline in relationship satisfaction? And relationship satisfaction is something that we're going to come back to later on in the interview, but uh, tackling this question now. So can that happen or not? Yes, definitely, especially when sacrifices are perceived especially costly. Um, we did a lot of work, actually, to try to understand what are the consequences of sacrifice for personal and relationship well-being. So how do people feel with themselves and with the relationship after they perform a sacrifice? And we were very curious about this because um, there are theoretical reasons to expect that sacrifice can be beneficial for the relationship. And there are also theoretical reasons to expect that it's actually detrimental. Um, also, before the meta-analysis that I conducted with my collaborators, um, uh, the, the findings in the literature were a little bit all over the place. So we did a really big meta-analysis to try to tackle this question. And um, what we saw is that um, there is not necessarily a reduction in relationship satisfaction. But after sacrifice, there is a reduction in personal well-being. So mm -hmm. there is an increase in negative affect. Um, the other interesting uh, part is that, uh, as you can imagine, this is for the person who does the sacrifice, so it's more likely to experience lower well-being. Mm -hmm. But how about the recipient of the sacrifice? Because, as I mentioned, sometimes they feel grateful. Um, and as you can imagine, the recipient has a lot to gain from the situation because they can do what they want, they can pursue their own preference, and also they just had a partner doing something very nice for them. Um, but interestingly enough, we don't see positive outcome uh, from the recipient perspective. And so part of it could be exp uh, exp um, explained by the fact that 50% of the sacrifices are not even seen. But then in uh, subsequent studies, we also uh, tested whether, okay, if you do see that your partner is sacrificed, how does it make it feel? And what we see there is that uh, there is actually an increase of both positive emotions and negative emotions simultaneously. 
So people do feel more grateful, they do feel appreciated by their partner, but they also feel guilty, they also feel inde indebted. And what happens then is that uh, the recipient of sacrifice have ambivalent feelings towards their partner. And unfortunately, ambivalent feelings are also more likely than uh, over time to, con to, to have some resentment towards the relationship and to lower commitment and having more thoughts of breaking up. Mm -hmm. And when do people regret uh, their own sacrifices? And in this particular case, what role might self-esteem play there? Yeah, um, of course, uh, sacrifices are costly, so it makes sense that at times people, especially if they focus on those costs, uh, they might regret their sacrifices. But indeed, what we see is that people who have low self-esteem are especially the ones to be more likely to regret the sacrifices. And it's because uh, people who have low self-esteem, they have, of course, a sense of low self-worth, and they tend to underestimate how much their partner loves them, how much their partner cares for them. So even in a situation of a sacrifice, they tend to underperceive the gratitude and the appreciation that their partner has for them. And if they experience this cost of giving up their own preferences, but not so much the benefit of seeing the gratitude and seeing, seeing that their partner is happy about what they did, they are more likely to experience only the cost and therefore then to regret their sacrifices, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And of course, people also weigh the costs of sacrifice, right? And uh, by weighing them, how does that affect the relationship? Yeah, the, um, the more people perceive cost in sacrifice, the more uh, they experience worse outcome after the sacrifice. So the relationship uh, satisfaction goes down, also the personal well-being goes down. So the key really after sacrifices is to uh, reappraise. So after you sacrifice, try to think about all the benefits that the sacrifice entails for you, for the relationship, for your partner, rather than all the costs that you had to incur because those are really just going to make you feel miserable, <laughs> pretty much. Um, luckily, we do this a little bit, uh, meaning that we did some research to look at the perception of cost before and after sacrifice, but also as compared to when you sacrifice or relatively to your partner or to a stranger. And we see that after we sacrifice, we perceive those costs less than before sacrificing, but also um, as compared to if the partner had to sacrifice or if a stranger had to sacrifice, you perceive that the cost you had incurred were less. So that's good. That's very healthy. But unfortunately, I don't think we are doing this enough because um, the meta-analysis that I was talking uh, about before showed that despite the fact that we do underestimate this cost, Overall, there is still a negative effect of sacrifice on personal well-being. So, although we do, we have this mechanism in place, we're probably not doing it enough, or maybe we're not focusing on the benefits enough, but we're still left with this lingering negative affect and this um, yeah, negative mood after we sacrifice. Mm -hmm. So, when in a romantic relationship there's divergence of interests, that is something you mentioned when talking about sacrifice, sometimes when that happens people uh, sacrifice a little bit for their partners or their partner. Uh, in, but when there's that, can empathy be a burden? Yes. Uh, so, first of all, situation of divergence of interest are very problematic situations in the relationship because by definition, the partners cannot do uh, what they want. I think one of them has to give up a preference yeah. uh, in a way or another. Um, so, these type of situations are very stressful for the partners and also uh, they tend to lower per se a relationship satisfaction. So, the least situation of divergence of interest the partner is encountered, the better it is for their relationship. 
That said, there are some people who are especially um, affected by these type of situations, and uh, those are also the one high in empathy. And that's because people who are high in empathy, they don't only are negatively affected because of their own outcome and their own stress, but they also incorporate their partner's sadness, discomfort, stress. And um, this sums up, and paradoxically, although typically empathy is a good trait to have in a relationship, if you have a relationship that is characterized by a lot of conflict, this might actually even backfire, at least backfire your own well-being, because you don't feel only bad for yourself, but you also feel bad for the partner. And so in cases like this, perhaps having stronger feelings is not always a good thing, right? It's not a good for, thing necessarily for your own outcome, meaning mm -hmm. that you might be even more stressed out. I don't want to say that it's not a good thing in terms of trying to find out solutions that might work for both partners, so interpersonally yeah. it can still be beneficial, but in terms of your own distress from the situations, yeah, empathic people might be more distressed. Mm -hmm. So another thing that I would like to ask you about regarding your work is perceived partner responsiveness. So where is it and how might it affect romantic relationships? This is a key variable in relationship science. It's like one of the most important constructs, meaning that we see a lot of beneficial effect from perceiving that your partner is, is responsive. And what do we mean with that? Mm -hmm. uh, we mean that your partner is understanding you, who you are, is validating you, so is understanding, also respecting and valuing you, and is caring for your own well-being. So when the partner has these three components, you perceive your partner to have these three components, that's when your partner is perceived to be high in responsiveness and is extremely, extremely beneficial for relationship. Maybe perhaps one of the most important uh, process. Um, for sacrifices, we also see that this variable plays a very important role because what we saw in our data, in our studies, is that if you do perform a sacrifice and your partner responds in a responsive way, so it's like understanding, caring, and um, validating your point of view, then you are more likely to reappraise the sacrifice in a positive way. You are less likely to regret the sacrifice, you're feeling better about your sacrifice, and your relationship is more likely to flourish. Mm -hmm. So perceived partner responsiveness is always a good thing, right? So far, in, in general, so what we've seen pretty much yes. <laughs> no, I, I was <laughs> just wondering it's because after a situation in which I see that uh, it can backfire. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was just wondering because the, since there's variability, there could be specific instances where people don't like for some reason that their partner are so responsive. I, I don't know. I don't know. We didn't find a strong, robust evidence for this yet, <laughs> quite yet. Okay. So, talking about conflict, of course, there's, al there's also always a little bit of conflict in relationships for different reasons. One of them might be what we talked about, like divergence of interests and all of that. But when conflict arises, how do people deal with it? Yeah, they, of course, can deal in very different ways. Um, but again, we need to categorize always responses in the literature. So we, scientifically speaking, we have a categories of prototypical responses, let's say, to conflict. And so uh, we categorize them in uh, pretty much four different types, um, which can be oppositional or cooperative. Maybe I should do the other way around. Op um, cooperative is when uh, the, the response is pretty much constructive. Mm -hmm. Oppositional is, as you can imagine, when it's a little bit more destructive. Mm -hmm. And also then we distinguish between direct and indirect. So, for example, when someone is dis uh, oppositional but direct, it's when they are in a conflict, blaming their partner if there has been a transgression, taking revenge, having this very direct negative response. Um, the destructive or oppositional indirect is when you tend instead to not really address the issue, but instead withdraw from either the conflict or the relationship. 
Then we have the cooperative constructive, that's when in front of an issue or a problem, you try to talk to your partner, analyze the situation, see all the pro and cons, find a solution in a more calm and rational way. And then we have the um, cooperative indirect, which is once again avoiding the issues, avoiding a little bit the conflict, but not withdrawing in terms of feelings from the relationship with your partner, but still uh, trying to be loyal to your partner, still showing appreciation and affect, but not really trying to solve the issue or the problem that the relationship is facing. Now, in terms of outcomes of this different way of solving conflict on actually then the relationship, we need to distinguish a bit uh, the short term outcomes from the long term outcomes, because for the short term outcomes, we see probably not surprisingly that the um, cooperative, so the constructive way of solving conflict leads to positive outcomes, while the oppositional way, the destructive one leads to negative outcome. But then when we look at the long term effect, we don't always see that. And that's really fascinating, I think, because at times what uh, research has found is that um, at times being the, being oppositional and direct can actually lead to improvement in the relationship over time. And that's because at times you really need to signal to the partner that an issue is important, that an issue needs to be fixed. And sometimes doing it also in a negative and direct way really signals to the partner, hey, we need to work on this. And then if the partner is able to make those changes to improve the relationship, then over time, actually, there can be improvement. Of course, this is not always occurring this way. There are all sorts of what we call it in the literature moderation. Mm -hmm. So all sorts of situations in which this the reasoning I just uh, mentioned applies or not. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if the problem is very minor and you are direct and negative, this is just backfiring. So the problem needs to be severe to be actually having such a strong response. And also, it very much depends on whether the partner, the partners, I would say, have the ability to make those changes. If they do, if the program is big and the partners have the abilities to change, then these strategies can lead to good outcome over time. But um, if the partners are not able to make those changes, then this negativity is just not going to lead to any improvement. So that's also why at times being having this uh, um, constructive but passive response that I was mentioning before of just not addressing the issues, but being just loyal and nice to your partner can also backfire because if there are issues at times they need to be confronted, especially if they are important. And if you just let go and let go and let go, this can lead to So one of the factors I read about in your work that apparently might play a role in how people deal with conflict is executive control. So what is that and what role does it play in this context? Yeah, executive control help us. It's basically the um, capacity that we have to change our thoughts, behavior and emotion according to some standards, usually long term goals. And so it is very useful during conflict because it allows you to step back from your impulses and instead act in a more long term uh, beneficial way. So we see often that people who have high executive control, they tend to uh, enact more constructive responses to conflict rather than destructive uh, responses. I will not be surprised though that at times executive control could also be used to be a little bit more direct. If, as I was mentioning before, if the problem is severe and needs to be addressed and people have some withdrawal tendencies, self-control can also help people though to be a little bit more direct rather than withdrawing. So it's always like what you think is the best strategies, your executive control helps you to achieve and um, perform that. And of course, uh, about control, uh, another fact that I think is important in romantic relationships is interpersonal trust. So in this case, the question I want to ask you is, is there a relationship between perceived 
self-control and interpersonal trust? Yes, we tend to judge other people perceive other people level of self-control in our interaction and um, people who are high in self-control they tend to be more reliable they tend to be more dependable they tend to be better able at achieving their goals and also interpersonally they tend to behave in a more appropriate way they tend to follow more the normative um, rules they also tend to refrain from selfish impulses at times and instead act in a pro-social way. And so for all sort of these sorts of reasons, indeed, our research shows that when you perceive someone else to be high in self-control, you are more likely to trust them as compared to when you perceive someone to be very impulsive and low in self-control. Mm -hmm. So uh, still within the domain of self-control, but going back to sacrifice for a second, is there any relationship between self-control and how much people are willing to sacrifice themselves in relationships and perhaps establish a balance between personal and relationship outcomes? Yeah, so what we see is that the people are the happiest with themselves, but also with their relationship, not only when they, so for example, they're not necessarily the happiest in the relationship when they invest, over invest in the relationship. They are happiest with themselves and the relationship when they are able to maintain a balance between mm -hmm. fulfilling personal goals and also relationship goals. Right. And self-control actually helps people to achieve this balance. So thanks to self-control, when you are, when you realize that you're over investing in one domain, you're better able to pay attention to the other than Wayne and reinvest in the other and vice versa. Um, so yes, it's, um, it is true that self-control enables people to live better lives. Let's say typically they have higher level of personal well-being. And one of the mechanisms why this occurs is because they are better able also to um, jungle with the different domains in their life. And one of them is um, the one of investing in personal relationship, in, sorry, in a relationship versus personal goals. Mm -hmm. So, and I think it's right to say that uh, the levels of self-control between partners are not usually uh, aligned. I mean, there's probably always a difference, even if it is small, uh, between partners in terms of their self-control. So when that happens, do people try to adjust their level of self-control to their partners? And if so, uh, how does that happen? How do they do that? Yeah, so uh, first of all, I, will, I want to say that uh, the happiest relationship seems to be the one in which both partners are high in self-control. Okay. Um, this also, especially in terms of romantic relationship, I can imagine also in terms of work relationship and um, many different type of relationship. Um, but I was, uh, as I was mentioning before, these high self-control individuals are high achiever, they work very hard, they uh, follow norms and rules and so on. And at times, there are situations in which they have a low self-control partners, either because they choose them themselves, as in a case of a romantic relationship, but it can also happen at work, for example, when you are in a team and you are assigned to work with someone and this person has low self-control. So what happens then? Well, we did some studies to, to test this um, you know, the dynamic in, in this context. And what we see is that, first of all, people seem tuned to understand the level of the another person's self-control, not sur unsurprisingly, especially in a context in which, for example, they need to work together. Um, but then what we see is that uh, the person who has high self-control and they perceive that their partner is low in self-control, then they tend to work extra hard. They tend to compensate for the fact that they expect that the other person is not going to put a lot of, not as much effort maybe, or not do the task as carefully, or yeah, to have some procrastination issues, all sorts of like impulsivity issues that low self-control individuals might have, might have. So it is true also that high self-control individuals are expected to work hard by others. 
and uh, sometimes they are asked to do more. There is research that shows that high self-control individuals are asked to do more in a work context, for example, and that at times they feel burdened by uh, by all these requests. So, um, and when and when this happens, actually, uh, this can have some this can damage the relationship as well. So, it is true that generally speaking, people who have high self-control they are also uh, the happiest in their relationship and in their personal life. But if the situation is such that the low self-control others ask a lot from them and the high self-control individuals feel, feel burdened by all these requests, then the relationship satisfaction can go down. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's usually not good for relationship satisfaction if there's a big gap uh, in in self control between partners, right? Yes, we don't exactly have that data, but as, as I was mentioned, so we don't really know how much if there is like a strong discrepancy. What are mm -hmm. the effects on relationship satisfaction? Mm -hmm. But what do we know is that to the extent that they're both high, then this is good for relationship. Mm -hmm. And of course, one of the things that people also think is good and try to take out of their relationships is for their partner to support their own goals and vice versa. And also sometimes people even, uh, I, we hear frequently people talk about this, that their partner uh, helps them achieve their Idea, the ideal ver version of themselves, something like that. So okay. starting with goal support, uh, what is interpersonal goal support and what is its importance in close relationships? Yeah, yeah. so we of course all have hopes, dreams, aspiration, ideal traits that we would like to have and we would like to achieve. And at times, thanks to the help and support from your partner, you are more likely to achieve those goals, dreams and aspirations or to become the person you ideally would like to be. Of course, at times your partner can also impair this goal achievement. And when that happens, it's really bad news, not only for your personal well-being, but as you can imagine, also for your uh, relationship. Yeah. While um, in so much that your partner helps you to achieve those goals. And this is, uh, this has a beautiful, this phenomenon is called Michelangelo phenomenon. I really like uh, the analogy, <laughs> the name. But to the extent that your partner is able to be the perfect Michelangelo sculpting the perfect David, then you're also more likely to achieve good outcomes in your relationship. But as I was mentioning, there is variability, right, in how much partners are good, both in terms of receiving help and support to achieve their goals, but also there is variability in how much the partners provide helpful support to do, to do so. And uh, what we see, for example, is that um, uh, when people are, uh, we call it promotion oriented, mm. that's when uh, this interpersonal goal support is especially beneficial. And uh, for promotion orientation, we means when people, so there are two different types of orientation. People can be either promotion oriented or prevention oriented. The people who are promotion oriented are the ones that tend to focus a lot on the gains in their environment. They're attentive to gains. They're trying to achieve positive outcome and mm -hmm. run away from, neg uh, sorry, run away from the uh, non gains. So not achieving this positive outcome. While the prevention individuals are the ones that are very attentive to possible losses in their environment and for losses, and they're really good and really try hard to avoid those losses. And what we see is that the people who have this positive outcome, these gains in mind all the time, these promotion-oriented individuals, are the ones that are also more likely to, first of all, seek support from others and also to be receptive to the support. And what we also see is that if their partner is promotion oriented, then they are also very good at providing support and the person is more likely to achieve hopes, dreams and aspiration. So for interpersonal goal support, it seems to be very beneficial to have this promotion orientation to really focus on opportunities on positive outcomes in the environment and this help enables this process. If someone is 
too much focus on running away from losses, from negative outcomes. They probably are not very open to support and they're also not very receptive and they're also not very good support provider in this context. And does deciding to support a partner in the pursuit of their particular goals depend in any way on the difficulty of the goals or not? Uh, yes, so it's a bit of a paradox if we think about it because we will need a lot of help and support when goals are difficult. Mm. Mm. But strangely enough, what we see is that people are actually not asking uh, so much support for difficult goals mm. and they're also not very open and receptive to support of difficult goals as compared to easier goals. And uh, this occurs because um, when, when you are trying to pursue difficult goals, people tend to have also lower self-efficacy. They don't feel very competent. Maybe they have a lower sense of that, cap cap that they're capable of reaching the goal. And because of this, they're also reluctant to seek help. Mm. And I think the reason why is that um, on one hand, you will need that support to maybe be better able to achieve that, that difficult goal. But at the same time, there are some interpersonal costs of receiving and asking support for something that is difficult. Because if you are not able to reach that goal, you might lose um, some value maybe in the eye of the person who is helping you, or you might be afraid that you're burden, burdening the person who is helping you because you can try to help and help and help, but you feel that you can't be able to achieve that goal anyway. So because of all this interpersonal cost, we are more reluctant to ask for help when perhaps sometimes we need it the most. And it's indeed, I can see how it is um, a tricky dilemma, because on one hand, it is true that we need it, but we also don't want to spoil or we are afraid of spoiling our relationships. Yeah, it, yeah, it really seems like a paradox because, I mean, logically, I think it would make sense for people to need more help or ask for help when the task is harder. Right? Mm -hmm. Indeed, yeah. Yeah, so uh, I mentioned uh, becoming our ideal selves in relationships earlier. So going back to that for a second, there's also this phenomenon slash concept of interpersonal regulatory fit. So what does that have to do with that specifically? And I mean, is it really the case that close partners can help us achieve our ideal selves or not? Yes, as I was mentioning, when people are promotion oriented, so when they focus a lot on gains, mm -hmm. this is when they are better able at both receiving support and providing support. Yeah. So what we tested in our in a series of studies is whether the best match for this Michelangelo phenomenon to occur, so to be able to achieve your ideals, hopes and uh, dreams and aspiration is when you are promotion oriented, so you are focused on, on gains and also more likely to seek and be open to support. Mm. And your partner is um, also promotion oriented, so is also more likely to know the best strategies to achieve those type of goals and is open to providing that type of support. And so we see that really like this combination of having a person who is high in promotion focus and a partner that is high in promotion focus, this is really beneficial for the pursuit of uh, hopes, dreams, and aspiration. Um, we also, of course, examine what happens when people are um, high in uh, prevention focus. So what happens when you you are high in prevention focus or really focus on the losses and avoiding losses? And yeah, your partner is similarly oriented. Does this have beneficial effect for goal support? No, we don't find that. Um, on one hand, there could be reason to expect that uh, this could also, this match could also work, not maybe as much for uh, hopes, dreams and aspiration, but what we know is that prevention oriented individuals, they are very attentive and really concerned with obligations, duties, responsibilities. These are the type of goals that they really like because are these goals that helps them to uh, keep safety and avoid losses. 
pretty much. So one idea would be, okay, this prevention individuals is really concerned with those goals. This prevention partner should also be concerned with those goals and maybe uh, tuned to those goals. Can the combination of these two uh, characteristics help people to achieve obligations, duties and responsibilities? No, apparently not. We don't see that. And, uh, and it is probably because um, prevention oriented individuals is so um, characterized also by, tend to be characterized by a high level of anxiety, mm -hmm. because of course it's focused on negative outcomes. And when you're feeling anxious, you tend to have a self focus and not being so much open to external help or support, like would be a partner. And similarly, a partner that is prevention uh, oriented also is feeling anxious, is probably involved and busy and preoccupied with their own goals and so on, doesn't have as much space to focus on their partner goals and help to achieve those goals. Mm -hmm. So uh, in romantic relationships, and I would imagine that this is not only the case in this kind of relationships, but also works for other close relationships, but there's different styles of attachment and usually what is deemed as the best one, the healthier one, let's say, is a secure attachment style or having, or having attachment security. So what characterizes that uh, attachment security? Yeah. Uh, people who are securely attached, they are feeling safe in the relationship. They are secure of the bond that they have with their partner. They are not afraid of intimacy and connection with their partner. Actually, they like that. Uh, but at the same time, they're also not afraid of being independent at times and exploring their own goals and doing their own things. So they have a very good balance between feeling safe and secure and wanting to connect with your partner, but at the same time also not being afraid of doing, having some independent goals. This, of course, um, this, this is the ideal world, but we know that world, but we know that, uh, that there are some people who are either anxiously attached or avoidantly attached. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the person who are anxiously attached, they are very much preoccupied with the fact that they don't think they are loved and appreciated as much by their partner. So they crave a connection with their partner, but they never really achieve it, not as much as they need. And so they typically exhibit some behaviors such as being clingy, uh, asking for a lot of reassurance from their partner, um, and they are very stressed out about the relationship. Uh, on the contrary, the people who are avoidantly oriented are the ones that um, they think that relationships are not very rewarding, uh, that their partner is not very trustworthy, uh, that they can be totally fine on their own. So they really appreciate independence and autonomy. And they have this protective mechanism of uh, not wanting to be vulnerable and hurt by relationship by saying, I'm, I'm fine by myself. Um, and so we see that this type of attachment insecurities tend to be dysfunctional for the individual overall. Uh, because people who are uh, insecurely attached, they tend to have lower well-being, so of course, lower relationship satisfaction when they are in a relationship. Um, now, um, it, it is true that theoretically these attachment styles will come from the experience you had with your caregivers during childhood. But then <clears throat> when we look at the empirical data, we see that the correlation between this uh, behavior that the caregiver had and your final attachment style as an adult, especially towards a partner, specific partner, is not very high. And that's because uh, the attachment style can also change over time. And I think this is a good news for uh, some people who have an insecure attachment style because they can become more secure over time. And it is also true that it depends on the partner you are interacting with. Mm -hmm. So although it is also a disposition that you have, so some people are more secure across relationship and some people are more avoidant across relationships, people are more anxious across relationships, that's for sure. 
but it also depends on how a specific partner is behaving. So if a partner, if for example, I'm a very secure person, but a partner is behaving in inconsistent ways, sometimes they are there for me, sometimes they're not there for me, then even if I am secure, I might become anxiously attached to this specific person. Or if this person is almost never there for me, really, it's behaving in a very untrustworthy way, then I can also become avoidantly attached to that individual. Although as a core, as a basis, I tend to trust that. That's very interesting because, I mean, people have this idea that if um, someone has a particular attachment style, then it's always the same across all their relationships. But if what you're saying is right, then that might not be the case. Correct? Exactly. And, uh, and that's why also it's very uh, beneficial for individuals to have a secure attached partner. So if your partner is securely attached, then is better able to behave in a way that is functional for the relationship. And even if you are not securely attached over time, you might become more securely attached. So that's also why at times people have had a, a problematic childhood with the parents not being like the perfect parents, very nurturing all the time. But then they have experiences with other caregivers, but it could be friends or partners that are actually very positive. Then their attachment style can improve over time and they can become more securely attached in this sense. Of course, it's also bad news if the other way around happens. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, attachment security can be fostered in relationships, right? Even if you are avoidant or anxious or tend to have one of those two kinds of or, or attachment styles, I mean, they can become or lean more toward a secure attachment style if you have those kinds of more positive or secure experiences, right? Exactly. Although uh, there is there are theoretical uh, there is theoretical work and also some empirical work that shows that the strategies to make anxious and avoidant individuals more secure is different. So there are different ways you should behave for an, with an anxious partner and with an avoidant partner. The anxious partner in the short term really um, needs a lot of reassurance that he, they are valued and cared and they are there for them. Uh, this works very good uh, in the short term and especially when there is a threat in the relationship or when the anxious individual is stressed out. But um, what, uh, if you really want to make also changes, long-term changes to their attachment style, what they argue, and there is some empirical evidence that supports these arguments, is that you really need to uh, modify also their sense of uh, self-worth in their relationship. So anxious individuals tend to think that they're not really, that their sense of self-esteem as a relational partner is very low. They, they tend to think that they're not very loved and uh, yeah, they feel low about themselves. So if you are able to, for example, by promoting their ideal self goals, so by making them more likely to achieve their hopes, dreams and aspiration, instill this sense of self-worth, then they are also more likely to become securely attached over time. So this works for the anxious individuals. For the avoidant individuals, instead, the strategy is very different. So what they say is that if there is a relationship threat, what you need to do in the short term is to leave, give space to the uh, avoidant individuals. They want space, they need space and autonomy. So in the short term, do that. But of course, if you keep doing that, then the partner will never realize that you're actually a trustworthy person and worth over having a relationship with. So when there is not such a threat, over time, what you need to do is to try to have a lot of positive experiences with your partner. So to create a lot of positive affect. For example, it's been shown that sex helps a lot, uh, avoidant individuals to become more connected with their partner and then to become also more secure. But also whenever your partner is there for you, showing a lot of gratitude and positive affect for the fact that he has been there for you, 
This type of strategies seems to uh, help the avoidant individuals over time to become more secure because they realize that having a relationship is not so bad. It can also be very rewarding and it doesn't have to have all this costs and all these demands and all this uh, negativity that they expect. Mm -hmm. So changing topics, uh, and I mentioned this in the lecture, you also study ambivalence in relationships. So what does that mean exactly? Yeah, so this is a topic that is not very much investigated yet in relationship science, but it's very important because it's very a state that it's very common. And of course, when people have high positive and high negative affect towards their partner simultaneously. So of course, in the ideal world, we will only experience high positive affect for our partner, but it's through that partner. And what that happens, of course, the more we are also likely to develop negative affect for them. Mm -hmm. So it's not it's not out of the extraordinary to have this mixed emotion for your partner. Of course, some people have more mixed emotions, some other people have a more like either positive or negative. And so what we are trying to do now is to understand what are the consequences of having these mixed emotions for your partner, independently of simply having negativity towards your partner. So it needs to be like just the awareness, the, um, just just knowing that, non, yeah, just realizing that you have these mixed emotions. And what we see is that um, this has negative outcome for uh, personal and relationship well-being because um, people don't like to, especially Western people, don't like to be very inconsistent and have positive and negative emotions and feelings simultaneously. We would like to have more clarity or more one unidimensional uh, way of thinking. Um, and so when there is this discrepancy, we are stressed out about it, we are trying to solve it, and um, uh, yeah, it's, it seems to be negative for the relationship, uh, especially when you are aware of, of this discrepancy. Mm -hmm. So in, in that case, it can have some sort of, or can depend on culture, right? Because since you mentioned Westerners in this case, I mean, possibly, Possibly, I'm just speculating, but maybe Eastern Asians, because those are two different cultural groups that we tend to compare in cultural psychology, for example, would deal with ambivalence in a different way. Yeah, there is not strong empirical support, although there is some partial support for this hypothesis that okay. Eastern Asian will, because they're high in what they call dialectical thinking, which mm. means that they don't are bothers as much by the contradiction of, for example, having po high positive and high negative affect, then they might also not be bothered as much by having this mixed emotion towards their partner and, um, and therefore not uh, have these negative affect uh, consequences on, on well-being. Mm -hmm. So, um, and what about implicit partner evaluation? Uh, what is that and what role does it play? Yeah, it's a very promising venue for uh, research in close relationships. We know a lot about implicit evaluations, which are pretty much the automatic affect that you feel towards something, and they're often measured with um, reaction time uh, measure. I don't know how familiar our audience is on, on this measure, but pretty much... Uh, yeah, but if you could explain it a little okay. bit, perhaps. Yes, uh, so pretty much uh, the way we measure implicit, par uh, implicit evaluations in, uh, in psychology is uh, um, because implicit evaluations are automatic attitude that you have when you encounter something. It could be a partner, it could be a political ideology, anything. And what uh, there are different reaction time tasks that helps you to assess these implicit evaluations. And for example, one typical one will be one in which, referring to the partner, for example, they will show you a picture of your partner. Partner, so they will prime you quickly with a picture of your partner, and then they will present you with some positive or negative words or stimuli. And they will ask you to categorize the stimuli as positive or negative by pressing 
uh, some um, button in your um, in your computer. And um, the assumption is that if you are, if you love your partner, if you have a lot of positive implicit attitude towards your partner, you see their picture, but then they present a negative, you are very slow at recognizing that the stimuli is actually negative and at pressing the negative bar, the negative button. Um, but if you really um, uh, have negative affect towards your partner and then they present the picture of your partner and then a negative stimuli, then you're very quick at recognizing that that's actually a negative stimuli. And, um, and this task is being used a lot in psychology, especially for certain topics such as self-esteem, but also uh, racial biases. And they are predictive of many different outcomes, especially of um, uh, uh, automatic behavior. You can imagine because it's an automatic attitude, so it predicts automatic behavior as well. But only in the past 10 years that have been used in relationship research to understand whether this type of automatic attitudes and tasks can help us predict relationship outcomes and relationship outcomes over time. And, um, and they seem very promising because what we see is that this implicit partner evaluation predict breakup, but also relationship quality over time at times even better than what a self-report that is just questionnaires do. So they're really important tools that uh, I think they need to be incorporated a bit more in the way we study uh, the affect that we feel towards our, our partners. Mm -hmm. But with what we know now at this point and taking into account that this is something implicit, do you have any idea uh, if uh, people are made aware of their of the of uh, how they implicitly evaluate their partner if they can do anything with that information if that would make any difference at all if they could correct in their behavior mm -hmm. or, or perhaps do something about uh, i mean knowing that having that knowledge they that they for example implicitly impl if there is something they c could do with that information to perhaps improve their relationship, their relationship outcomes or something like that? Yeah, so <clears throat> they're not very implicit evaluations are not very easy to change. Mm -hmm. uh, we did some uh, research that looked at exactly like how do they form and um, how likely are to change according to, for example, daily dynamics that we have with our partners uh, yeah. on a daily basis. And we see that um, while the self-report questionnaires are actually more likely to change, uh, the, the way we report our conscious feelings are way more likely to change on a daily basis as compared to these implicit evaluations. And um, according to the literature, but also we have partial support in our data on this, is that they seem to be more a product of an accumulation of experiences and affect that you have right. of which partner. So they build over time and they build more slowly. And so that's why also they are more difficult to change. Maybe also that's why uh, they are also very um, predictive of what, what happens along the line because they they just not reflect simple fluctuations, but they're really like the building block almost of what has happened in your relationship history. Uh, that said, there is uh, one paper by Jim McNulty that uh, shows that you can try to uh, change these implicit evaluations by evaluative conditioning. So if, for example, you're repeatedly doing a task um, in your computer in which they pair in your, the picture of your partner with positive words or images, over time your implicit evaluations also becomes more positive, at least in the way we measure it, whether then these implicit evaluations will translate into more positive automatic behaviors in your relationship, that's also an, an interesting question uh, that future research should definitely uh, answer, try to answer. Great. So uh, just one last topic then. Uh, I would like to ask you about relationship satisfaction. So 
do we know, of course, we've been talking about several different factors that might contribute to relationship satisfaction in general uh, in this conversation, but I'm sure that there would be many others. So do we know what factors contribute to the maintenance and decline of relationship satisfaction? We know a great deal about which factors are associated with relationship satisfaction at one time point. So um, typically also the tool that is most used in relationship research is the one of self-report measures. So we ask people how they think about themselves, how they think about the relationship and their partner. And we see that the strongest predictors are uh, perceived partner responsiveness. So to the extent that you perceive your partner to be there for you, understanding, caring, that's strongly linked to relationship satisfaction. Relationship has been very close and intimate to the extent that you perceive your partner to be very satisfied with your relationship and committed. Um, and if you perceive that you have conflict, uh, that's also related to negative uh, relationship satisfaction. Uh, so the most important, at least in terms of self-report uh, measure, seems to be this perception of the relationship or your partner. Mm -hmm. A little bit less of a role, but still a role, is played by um, individual uh, traits or the individual characteristics, such as, well, we were mentioning a secure attachment style is usually linked to negative outcomes for a relationship satisfaction. But also, um, if you're not happy with yourself, you also tend not to be happy with your relationship. So people who are low in life satisfaction, who are depressed, anxious, they also tend to not be satisfied in the relationship. These were uh, regarding the self-report measure. Then, as I was mentioning, there is, of course, the role played by the implicit partner evaluation. There is, of course, a role played by the communication strategies. And as I was mentioning, there is a distinction between what happened on the short term versus the long term. Um, then there are some few biological indexes and demographic that might matter. And then something that matters is uh, the life, life events. Um, and so these um, certainly have an impact on relationship satisfaction at the same time. But then one of the mystery of our field, one of the things that everybody would like to know is, is my relationship going to last? Is it going to be successful or not? It's going to end. I mean, we know that uh, many marriages end in divorce uh, as well. So it's a, it's a very interesting and uh, important question. Um, and uh, the, the interesting fact there, but first of all, I need to mention that relationship satisfaction goes down over time. This is one of the most robust effects that we see in the literature. There is a, st a steady decline in how satisfied people are with their relationship over time. Uh, can we predict uh, these changes over time? Well, if we look at uh, the self-report measure, uh, so all these questionnaires, it seems to do a poor job in predicting what happened in the relationship over time. Mm -hmm. Implicit evaluation seems to be, there is not as much research as for the self-report measure. So there, more research needs to be done in this domain. But the data we have so far seems to be quite promising that these implicit evaluations really seems to be diagnostic of changes in relationship satisfaction over time. But then one of the strongest, um, one of the strongest predictors is we know that um, transition to parenthood, having children, really creates a dip in relationship satisfaction over time. Uh, becoming unemployed, you see, you see a big dip, uh, getting sick, uh, or also uh, uh, finding uh, attractive alternatives, so like uh, finding desirable other partner with whom to start a relationship that can also close, uh, create a big a dip in uh, in the relationship satisfaction. Yeah, I mean, the, the part about having kids is very interesting, at least to me, because uh, I mean, just intuitively, I would imagine that having kids would bring people 
together even more. I mean, because they would supposedly need even more support from each other to raise their kids, right? But it doesn't appear to be so. Well, so what I was talking about is relationship satisfaction, how satisfaction, how happy you are with your partner. Okay. And then there is another very important construct in relationship, which is commitment, which is how much do you want the relationship to last a very long time? Oh, okay. These two constructs are, are correlated, but they're not the same. So what we see with children is that the relationship satisfaction goes down, but the commitment can at times even go up or can go up because you have the kids. And so you need to stay together to indeed you need each other to be able to raise uh, your children in a, in a very healthy way. Oh, okay. So, uh, Dr. Rigetti, just before we go, would you like to tell people where they can find you and your work on the internet? Yeah, I have a personal website, www.francescarigetti.com. So it's my personal website. You can also Google Francesca Rigetti for Amsterdam. You can find uh, their website there, I'm sure. Um, and of course, you can always uh, contact me as well at my email address, drigetti at vu.nl. Okay, great. So thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. It was a fun conversation. So. Thank you, Ricardo, for inviting me once again. Thank you for your attention. Okay.